It's a feminist thing, a space where we'll be engaging in a very important conversation. Our goal, to dismantle patriarchy. Today we're talking about indigenous cultures and reveal the different ways they encourage the oppression and mistreatment of women. You can join our conversation by reaching out to us on all our social media pages. I'm not alone in this dismantling. Yeah, patriarchy. It's a male, my feminist. I'm a holo. Pina kodi sang tando kumede lingi koshi kwamba ane. Culture is such a loaded topic, mm -hmm. but what do we understand from the term itself, culture? I think a lot of people seem to think that culture is just about you know your tribal traditions or being Zulu, or being Tswana, or being you know vendor speaking, and it's not about that. You know, culture is about a long-standing practice. It's something that people do over a long period of time. And so when, you, when we kind of broaden the meaning and the understanding in that way, it means that we can look into other spaces where there's been things that have been going on for a very long period of time that refuse to, to evolve, that in this context are actually just quite toxic and wrong. Culture is also something that we do as, as human beings, right? And I think that I conduct myself personally differently mm. depending on where I am. Mm. So I have to code switch. I conduct myself, you know, with mm. respect. Mm. I perform particular gender roles mm. because I don't want to mess up the culture and the practice. Why of not, by the way? The... What are you afraid of? What would happen mm. if you put your urban girl in attitude in a rural setting. Are you, what are you trying to achieve? There's too many mm. people bye, bye. to fight against. There's it's too just many too people much. to fight against, but I also enjoy sitting in, around a table with women peeling potatoes. Mm. Not because I'm peeling potatoes, but because of the conversations that happen there. Mm. I actually feel affirmed by being part of that space and hearing the conversations that, mm. on that level. So there's Before a part of you that enjoys, enjoys. the yes. perspective of it. I don't mind um, cultural practices, um, as long as they suit me. Mm. Mm. Yep, and I understand that if they suit me, they may not suit my family. Yeah. Um, but I think culture should be fluid. Mm. Culture is not static. Yeah. I think we should take what we need from culture and certainly throw out some of the more problematic aspects. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah. Let's let's talk about culture beyond just you know the tribal context. I mean, let's look for instance at organizational culture where mm. women are forced to wear heels mm -hmm. and they're not allowed to show the shape of their body or even to reveal their breasts. You know, a part of the body that is as natural as your legs and your arms mm. cannot be seen. Never mm. mind um, you can't see your legs. There's some cultures where women have to be completely hidden when yeah. they're in public or not going to be seen um, or, or if they're not around their relatives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, and I try so hard not to judge it. <laughs> but, then <there's> also, <laughs> but then there's also pop culture, right? Yeah. And pop culture, you know, how it influences us as well. The idea of the worship of money, mm -hmm. the worship mm -hmm. of capitalism, or mm -hmm. also the use of the woman's body to, to sell products, oh. mm. right? Mm. Or oh, wow. to sell, you know, luxury and an expensive life. And, you know, that has also influenced us in a particular way. Mm. Yeah. I think it's influenced all of us. I think anybody <laughs> who claims to yeah. be completely yeah. removed from the influences yeah, and of this culture. That's why, as Soul City, we do the work we do. Yeah. Mm. You know? We want people to be drawn to the constitution, to their rights, to, to live their life the way they want. Mm. A way of life as we, as we mm. use sociology 101. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about choice really yes. and even me judgmental me and this is I'm like one of the problematic feminists of the past mm. who used to be much more judgmental of like why are you wearing such a short skirt no I was I was very problematic but now my understanding of what feminism is is for women to do whatever the hell they want to do. Mm. Yeah. Really, Ever. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Whether it's cultural. It's like, mm. As long as we do what we choose to do. Problem mm. culture, how is that conform? Like you were saying, mm. there's too many people to fight. Yeah. Mm. You are ostracized mm. and you are treated as the other. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, look at me. I guess I'm a cry yeah. for help. I don't mind being ostracized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I struggle even now to understand 
understand because go hire a police who are going to lend to everyone. Get culture, get custom. You just get free flowing. Come on, so me and Alvin, yes, this is one because me na I tell you, go get it, baby. <laughs> like, I like short pants, neck the mm. Even in, in professional environments, because sure. it's hot. Yeah. And I should be able to wear whatever I want Agreed. to wear. Agreed. Agreed. Give us your viewpoints, South Africa, on this matter. Join the conversation on our social media pages. Okay, now that we are all clear about culture and customs, let's kick off with our language feature expert, Ponzo Pilan. <laughs> So born as his born so. Like I feel as well. Yes. What is the term of the day? Today's term is male privilege oh. and it's such a mouthful. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> male privilege is a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a And to loosely translate that is that it is the respect and the dignity that is given to men mm. simply on the basis of their gender or mm. how they perform their gender. Yeah. Mm. So they get paid more Yeah. Status. Yes. You know, yes. and that's that exactly it. Men banal status. It's very appealing so. Lero na sereba fangson. Nkelo buza si swam. How would you translate that male privilege? That's what I would say. Yeah. Because Ukshonipa encompasses respect and dignity. Mm. Right. And when you say Gakulu, it means that you're doing a lot. I want us to take a look at the customary laws that govern people who are traditionally married, whether in monogamous or polygamous relationships. They are protected by the law, but do they have equal claim to property according to custom? I want to tell you about a story mm. about a woman who was threatened to be murdered um, based on the premise that she had fought for her right, uh, her marital right, mm. to have land of her uh, deceased husband. Is this happening in 2020, Batumamudu? Yeah. Yeah. Feminists that are living in rural communities, that bill that has not been signed, the traditional mm. courts bill, is going to give too much power mm. to the chiefs mm. to become their own courts, mm. right? right? Which means that they won't have access to yeah, this mulao on our maho, our Roman dachi, oru sailing. Hey, Marago, mind the mulao. Wait, it's Wait, it's convenient. No, it's a nyana. Yeah. Obviously, for women, it works that the constitution um, enshrines our rights, and it, it doesn't work for us that yeah. our own families are trying to kill us because we're trying to claim land to something that actually rightfully belongs to us. But you know, we're here to make this language accessible to yeah. our parents, to our brothers and sisters. Mm. Sure. It's just interesting because there are so many complexities. Mm. Like it's so layered. Mm. Mm. And I wish the discussion can continue even in the homes. Mm. So we're going to take an ad break right now. And when we come back, we continue with the discussion. Sounds good. good. Welcome back. We are still forward, fearless and feminist. Which means Santa Nerle go pili bilere papa. Of course. Kare tsabi silo. And Santa Nerle ma feminist. Of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, when you get your first period, mm. it kind of saddens me because what's supposed to be something that's quite beautiful mm. um, and life changing becomes this the first source of shame mm. that we as black that's girls true. are directed towards. Yeah. How would you imagine celebrating your period? How would you make a ritual out of that, Tando? I've seen people who've thrown red parties, mm -hmm. um, surprise red parties with only women in the room. And then everyone dresses in red and they kind of bless the girl to kind of take away the shame and make it like a rite of passage, but an honorable, beautiful you know, process. Mm -hmm. I would say the same way that the boys happen. You know, first of all, there's something beautiful about isolation. Mm. Um, so when you take these girls who are about the same age, they become peers mm. and you isolate them and you talk to them about what it means mm. to be a girl or a woman in 2020. Because... But to be quite honest, like, Humansa is not all that great eh? and it's not all that happening. Number Isn't one, it? it's painful. Uh, it can it be. be. Yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, some, some women are literally incapacitated. 
Yes. Mm. Yes. But see, if you look at the society, mm. then you know how to, to protect these women. Yeah. And to know how to protect these women. It's possible to protect these women. Menstruation is complicated. It but is. I think the fact that we don't celebrate it makes us feel like, oh my God, this is really something to be ashamed of. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, my dad, right? He was such a brilliant mm. man. He used to know when we are on our periods. He used to like feel our oh. pain and make it easy for us oh, to wow. soup just for the pain, you know, mm. to put heat mm. in the stomach so that the pain is better. But I loved how even when you've hanged your bras and your panties on the washing line, that man will remove them. Fold them nicely for you and pack them away. So, that's that's nice. 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 you know, and that's very big for in in our country where mm. one of the biggest insults that anybody can throw at a man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But to get a male perspective on this conversation, we are joined by the author of A Man Is Not A Man, Tandum Kolozani. Uh, hello, Tando. Welcome. Hello, Nico. And uh, hello to your co-panelists and to all the viewers. Let's dive right into it. Would you say that there's a link between how males are taught about manhood and traditional rites of passage ceremonies and violence against women? Without any doubt, um, I would say yes. And, uh, you know, to support the, this uh, position, I will use the, um, the, my debut novel, A Man Who Is Not A Man, in which there is a scene where I describe what is called the house of the lamp, Kanyagestosa, in Liniespan. This is when, um, you know, the initiate is returning and is welcomed by you know, fellow circumcised men um, and, and joined <coughs> by, by ladies, by girls. But what happens at the House of the Lamb, as it is described in the book, is that the girls are distributed in that house to any man, oh. and oh. they have no say who they're going to end up with on the night. Oh. I know that in my time, that was something that was happening. I'm not sure if it's still happening now, but as, oh. I assume that as long as there is in U.S. Ban, it will, it will be there. This is in reference to Uluwaluko, and that's just one element. But the whole issue about it is that Uluwaluko, as, as it is practiced today, is about preparing young men to assume their positions in the patriarchal order, which is about dominating women. That is the mm -hmm. that is the essence of it. Mm -hmm. And some of the of the some of the things that you know young men are taught there is. Um, you know, I, I remember this being said to me, and I was so shocked that we indoor Dangoku, that means there is mm. no woman who is bigger than you, mm. <laughs> including, including your mother. Mm. And I was like, yeah. what is that? What's interesting, Utandu, is that mm. on the first day, well, on the day of circumcision, that when you get snipped, um, you're supposed to say, daughter, in the same way that Nelson Mandela tells us mm. about his most embarrassing experience, um, is that actually he cried out um, when it was his turn for that to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, um, also in, in the movie that um, that I wrote in there, but this is one of the opening scenes where you have to declare yourself to be, to be a man. Um, I described the same thing uh, in A Man Who Is Not A Man, and the young man is unbelieving that just like that, daughter, what does that even mean? <laughs> you are talking about really hugely secretive mm. um, issues. Why? One, why so much secrecy? And two, why are you being so brazen and brave by saying, no, we're going to have a conversation yeah. about this and I'm going to reveal some of this stuff. And I'm sure you're not even telling us a quarter or half of the things mm. that happened in the mountain. Why did you make those choices? I mean, I, I realized, um, to that some of the ways in which this particular ritual, you know, is being carried out today are not even, you know, the values for which it existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there was no such a thing, you know, there was no such a thing in which women are not supposed to be involved and uh, they're not supposed to know because women had a role um, in the process of, of circumcision. So it's a new thing in the way that the culture has adapted itself so that now we're talking about what happens in the mountain stays in the mountain. It was never a thing. So, so for example, who a mother of an initiate has a name, has a role. The sister of an initiate has a name, has a role. So this is all 
contemporary mm. twisting mm. of the original thing. Every circumcision season, there is reports of young men who go to the mountain, you know, with the idea of, of becoming men, and they either get mutilated or they die. Mm. And it always mm. bothered me that we we don't talk enough about mm. this. When this happens, when, when you know, there's this bot circumcision, the, 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 the blame is put on the initiate that mm. there's something mm. you did not do, right? You did not observe the protocols properly. So you're blamed. So you can't speak. You don't have a voice to say, wow. yeah. this is what I was wow. subjected to and so on. Wow. All of those who are affected, they get muted and they disappear afterwards. So I thought somebody has to speak for the voiceless here. Mm, yeah, I agree with you that somebody must speak for the voiceless. So how do we change these problematic and harmful cultural practices without necessarily losing the essence of who we are as a black people? Mm. What I've chosen to do is, as a person who observes those traditions, I have to speak because people from within the culture are the ones who are supposed to stand up and speak and start this conversation so that mm -hmm. we can start looking mm -hmm. at ourselves and say, you know, do we want to be killing and mutilating um, our children like this? What are we achieving by that? And what, what is it that we can change? That was so insightful. And quite frankly, the conversation is very yeah. disruptive and, mm. and necessarily so. Patriarchy is so violent. Mm. These rituals into manhood are violent and they are sad, quite frankly. principles And it means culture, which I don't necessarily believe in. Mm. But anyway, there there you have it. Violence against women it plays out in so many different ways. Mm. What we teach our children and the generation that follows influences how women in our society are treated. Later, we'll discuss whether the Constitution protects women and queer people against discriminatory cultural practices and how the erasure of women happens through marriage and wedding ceremonies. Don't go away. Mm. My favorite topic yeah. is... <laughs> Welcome to It's a Feminist Thing, Dr. Noguzola. Hey, Zapotisa, thank you very much. You're welcome, Ma. So let's start here before we go anywhere. Are you a feminist? I would say I'm a womanist. Oh, okay. And what would be a difference between a womanist and a feminist? Mm. As a womanist now, I'm saying I must deal with my own issues and not be dictated by anybody from another culture or from another spirituality or from another race for that matter. So when a mama being said, look who's good here and a little ball of being the one Johnny Tala before a colonization and before a a a whitewashing of a culture yet. Oh, Kana, who never understand what is a little Ilobola is a process, it's not an event. And Ilobola, I see your lendo in Nunanam Trans and Nithing Ba Imadi, eh, Yakuz of Niki Mali. No, yeah. What, what happens when the two people get together and decide mm. to marry? Mm. It stops being an affair of two people, mm. it becomes an affair of two families. Mm because we are building a relationship now between these two families. Mm. That is why in Nguni, for instance, we, we, we say uh, these, the parents of these two, they call each other abakos. Mm. So snabakos in Google. Mm. So we are related by marriage. So now there are processes to build that, mar that, that, that relationship. One of them is Ilobola. In terms of Abantu who are queer couples, at the same time you've got Abantu as far as anybody to Abafunukshatana. What then are some of the challenges that might appear in, the, in those types of processes? Uh, I, I want to be honest in Danamina because mm. marriage in the first place, in, from an African context, mm. is for procreation. Mm. It's not necessarily for, for love. Ufnega, Ube Kona, E. Some children. Songo, Utagan, Wobu, Ungamatomas and Amadini, 
where are we going to have the grandchildren who are biological in this family? One. Number two, Siso Tabaganda ni Ubanoza by in clubbing because in society to I male in doba it could be a woman as a part of um condo yo ma epsandi it epsandi emma zis is lap and amsanti siso sabela utatum kulu there's nigga lengabenko mutatum kulu so sitela nyam kele lengomo and then abe petum kondu nega sabi who can get so challenges because being a woman. What about the rise of a female who wants to marry another female? In the African culture, we are not talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. We are talking about us. So there are norms, there are rules that are set that we must also agree so that we become a united a, a, a family. So now, Uba gen wogus is our teta gay individual rights. Individual rights that may hamper the future of this family, then they, there will be problems. I think we must just remember that everybody has a right. Even if your opinion differs from my opinion on things, we must remember that the foundation for all of us is the rights that are enshrined in the constitution mm -hmm. of the country. So whether we agree on certain things, we must not be exclusive and not inclusive, right? So people must still feel that even if I enjoy different things from what Tando enjoys, I still belong. Mama, mm. I mean, same-sex people are here, right? And arguably, they've been around even before colonial times. So my question then becomes, when Zenjanu Muntu, who's in a same-sex relationship, from your perspective as a womanist, how would one navigate marrying um, as a same-sex couple within customary rights? Because the fact is that we are here and the culture to must save us as a bantu. You know, when we talk about Isiko in the African context, mm. or from my experience, mm. we are talking about it, that activity where there's always a, a communication between individuals and the spiritual world and the ancestors. So those do not change. What changes are the tools that we are using what changes is the environment? Mama Yaz, I think you bring an, an interesting perspective, mm -hmm. but I would, I would like to challenge you a little bit. When Indota passes away in a family, mm -hmm. we are very quick to say that the woman, the survivor of that deceased husband, ought to marry the brother of the deceased in order for her to keep her estate. And yet, when it comes to same-sex relationships and where the lineage is going to come from, we never consider the possibility of the brother, I mean, or, or, or of a, a sibling mm -hmm. being a potential donor of either a, a sperm or an egg. So I just want to challenge you there to say that it's not true that the lineage of the family will be broken in a same-sex relationship um, or, or a marriage you can still continue the lineage, the true lineage of the family, even in a same-sex relationship. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up the conversation, I wanted to ask, what does the future then look like, mm -hmm. you know, going forward? Because yeah. we want to have actual solutions. So what does an inclusive future actually yeah. look like? Hey, that is going to take time, Dana. Okay, man. Mm -hmm. I want to be honest. Yeah. Because this was confused. Perhaps we need some education from you, but can this educator don't come go army because nothing is so resist. Mm. Because we still want to treat to our cultures. Unfortunately, time is never enough to have these kind of discussions, Ma. But I agree, education and more conversations needs to happen. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you invite me again. Thank you so much for your time. This conversation was I mean, it's a very contentious conversation. Very. But I think we need to be, you know, resolute on a, on a few things. Mm. The first thing is that the Bill of Rights was created out of the recognition of the fact that individual needs mm. are important. Mm. 
and that we cannot kind of um, deviate or subvert or oppress mm -hmm. individual human rights and needs mm -hmm. for the sake of the community. Yeah. So the, the understanding that Doctor was unpacking now, I think for me is, is quite archaic. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that group rights or communal rights are not important. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that we have a constitution that is the supreme law of the, ra mm -hmm. of the land. And this yeah. constitution recognizes that we really do need to make paramount human rights and individual rights. Sure. Because when you only focus on communal rights, it leaves a huge gap sure. for the violation mm. of individual rights, mm. which is what has been happening in our society historically. Mm. An interesting Linzako, our roving reporter, had this kind of a conversation mm. with people um, out on the streets, right? Mm. So let's go and hear what they were saying. Definitely. What does Lobola mean for you and what did it mean for you in the process of getting married? It's one of the beautiful things that they've been tainted, obviously, by perception and what others feel and whatnot. But I don't think it's something that we need to do away with. It's a beautiful process. I, I really beautiful. think it is yeah, because, because yeah. Yeah. you know, bearing in mind, obviously, we'll see these things also have ancestral implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to be married and think, oh, we're sorted, and yet your ancestors know nothing mm -hmm. of this union. Yeah. And Am I African customs? Do you think we would today pushing a patriarch? Our, our process almost got very complicated because then my paternal side of the family hmm. felt like they they had to get the, the money. So the, the process of Ilobola had to be done on their side. Hmm. But then there was some form of disconnection when I was growing up from my paternal side. Hmm. So I ended up living with my mother's family. And though that's that's where the letter went and that's where the negotiations happened. Hmm. Uh, but that, that just complicated the process. So in terms of looking at how Ilobola was done um, in terms of our traditions mm -hmm. being done on the father's side of the family, then it's patriarchal just in, in that sense mm -hmm. for, for us. That's that's how I experienced it. She was not allowed to be involved in the mm -hmm. process. I feel it is more patriarchal in that sense. But... I'm starting to feel like Uti Ilobola is the buying of, of women. Do you think Ilobola is accommodative of the LGBT community? And what was that process like for you? We were like, OK, guys, you don't know what to do make a plan. And then two years yes. later, they were able to. to so it, it's about yeah. rewriting mm -hmm. within yes. the parameters. Culture is not static, right? Mm. It's constantly changing. Yeah, and it, should, yeah. it should change as Nazi see change and Jenga band. Mm. So if Gunamanto was a night who at from shot and we can see with, okay, Lobo and Clambis or Cancela out or whatever, the fact of the matter is, these two families need to meet. So I think for the first time, even my family, they're more open-minded now. So the next person who wants to marry and they're marrying someone of the same sex, Sosias, Sosias, which is what must happen. Yeah. But it needed to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. How do we evolve this to not also make you feel like you're buying her and you feel like you're being sold? Yeah. So let's also look at the circumstance and what can he afford? What are the circumstances affording us to, 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 to do? Like just redefine yeah. what the process means for us. I think yeah. that's that's a way to move forward yeah. because it won't be the same for me. It won't be the same for, for the next person. We need to let go of this image that this a woman is helpless and she needs someone to come in and save her, mm. someone who's going to make sure that she's financially secure when you can also do that yourself. I think that's why also these marriages also end early because already Ungena Sydney Colot or you owe this person, you owe that person and whatnot. And there's an expectation right. How do we now remove a patriarchy from Yes, <laughs> <laughs> are very important. Um, yeah, and our process was fully done by Utabao. I even have family where something like that is is happening. That he's he's more of the you know I'll I'll take care of the kids. I'll I'll clean. I'll cook. Mm. I'll do everything. 
because I'm unemployed now and, and, and I have all this time. Why should you come back from work or and, and still do all of this work? I mean, we need, we need to live in an equal society now. Yeah. <laughs>so oh, you know for me one of the things that stick out of that insert watching mm -hmm. is that um marriage is so much more in african tradition when we talk about ancestral ties mm -hmm. so that's why it's important you're not just combining two individuals mm -hmm. you're combining two legacies mm -hmm. i suppose of people for me this whole struggle and issue about money is actually probably tied in colonialism and you know capitalist intention. Mm. And so for me, I just I just find it so problematic that we even in 2020 refuse to let go of colonial thinking, even in the most intimate spaces of our lives. Marriages are about land, mm. are about inheritance, mm. are about forming alliances mm. between people who need to fight a common cause. Mm -hmm. So love is it's a nice to have, but historically speaking, whether you're speaking about colonialism or pre-colonialism, mm. as the good doctor would have said, mm. there's a, usually a good reason mm. for marriage to take place, and love is typically not it. I clearly, my feminist, those two lesbians were doing the impossible. Yeah. <laughs> because according to our doctor, what they did is just not something that's supposed to happen or even mm. can happen. Mm. So yeah, it's that queer magic, mm. I suppose. <laughs> Um, you know, as you can see, it's vitally important that we know our rights, mm. but also that we make an assessment of some of the customs and practices enforced on us so that we can make our own decision on how customs can exist in our contemporary society without erasing entire groups. Remember to share your thoughts on our social media pages. Colonization played a huge role in changing some of our customs. Women had a say in tribal gatherings and mm. they even had a voice in their community. Yeah. And we've touched on the impact of these practices. We've touched on how they have impacted on women's lives. But what impact have they had on men and queer people? Here to discuss this is Professor Gopano Radele. It's time for Allies Corner. Uh, Professor Ratele, thank you for joining us again. You know, there's a term that African hegemonic masculinity. <laughs> what exactly is that? And go um, like the example Sinyana Um in simple terms, it's the dominant way of being an African man or boy or masculine subject. When we say it is hegemonic, we simply mean that it, it is supported by the majority of people without it being violent. So, for instance, if uh, you live in a place where it says men should uh, not take care of children, for instance, mm -hmm. nobody forces you to do that. Yeah. But you start believing that it is not men's job to take care of children. Prof, what did colonization do to our African perception of our sexual and gender identities? Colonization yeah. really messed up men mm. uh, across Africa, but everywhere where, you, where the colonizer arrived. Mm. So let me put it this way, in South Africa in particular, uh, from the, from the 17, uh, you know, 17th century, so take when men were forced to leave their families then, when mining uh, exploded, basically, in South Africa. And so mining becomes part of the colonial capitalist machine. Mm. It forces men to leave wherever they are, they've been doing their productive means uh, of life, uh, of earning a living, and say, go to Johannesburg, go to Kimberley, go dig some diamonds, some gold. And in that moment, it just basically disrupts everything mm. that these men had known up to that moment. But you can see how it doesn't only do something to men, because when you leave home, you're part of this family, you will live somewhere in, in Johannesburg in a hostel. The lack of dignity in Cape Town in, in Johannesburg is, is immense. Yeah. But it also disrupts the family structure. And mm. that moment is something we're still uh, having to pay for and the colonizer 
even if the colonizer sometimes has left. I just want us to talk a little bit more about um, how colonization has impacted queer lives, you know, in our society today. There is a, a presumption that, you know, queerness is an African. I mean, is that even true? It's impossible that you can have a society where you don't have desires as a male-bodied person for other men, as a trans person, uh, or as a as a bisexual or a, or a queer woman. What colonization did with the, all over the, uh, Africa, by the way, mm. is introduce what are called penal codes. Colonization itself was homophobic. So it yeah. introduces a particular ways of thinking about people of different desires. A particular practice that I always give an example for. This is an amazing practice where women, older women and younger women, could sleep in the same bed. And in that moment, if you think of queer as not just a, a sexual identity, but as an identity about intimacy, about a life together of women, women who were washing each other. It is the most incredible thing. That one practice and other practices were disrupted, were called uh, unnatural mm. uh, colonization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kopana Ratele, for your insights. It's quite interesting to me, Tando, that even how we archive mm. our practices and our cultures, we've erased queer yeah. history, yeah. we've erased queer existence, yeah. and you know, perhaps not having the language for it is something that we never needed, yeah. but we have Ooh. not codified its existence. Yeah, look, the, the reality is that our existence has been disrupted. And it's funny and ironic to me that people feel a certain way when we say that we want to disrupt and dismantle patriarchy. Mm. When we were being disrupted, disrupted and being dismantled mm. before colonization, I mean, during colonization. Patriarchy is imperialism. Yeah. That's one thing that we yeah. should put out there yeah. for men. It's something that was a tool of oppression of colonization, and it's imperial. Mm. Next up, we explore the ways in which we can move our society forward by making the necessary changes to cultural practices without losing our essence. Keep engaging with us on our social media platforms, and we look forward to reading your comments. Welcome back. We're still speaking culture and customs. My fellow feminists, mm -hmm. can culture and custom truly evolve? I mean, just looking back at what we had discussed earlier, the truth is that custom is a long-standing practice mm -hmm. and its legitimacy is based on the premise that it has been practiced for a long period of time without any interruption and disruption. And yeah. even from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. that's how we recognize, you know, different types of, of, of cultural and customary practices. Mm -hmm. So can we truly say that culture and custom can evolve in our society? Look, you have all these beautiful rights and entitlements. But like you said earlier, we are not able to access all of them. Mm. But let me tell you what I think about culture and practices. Mm. For as long as they are harmful and they deny people access to their rights, mm. I say those must be dismantled. Mm. We must do to those what COVID did to the whole world. Yes. It came and disrupted the normal, yeah. yeah. changed yes. the status yes. quo, yes. right? Yes. So yeah, yes. that's what I think. But you know, I think Tando, just to jump onto your point about it being a long-standing practice, mm. Weddings and funerals are long-standing practices, but mm. how we do them mm. has definitely changed mm. over time. Wow. If you think about how we bury yeah. um, our dead, how mm. the white wedding dress, you know, mm. the coffin, mm. these are not things that were part of our customs or mm. culture, yep. you know, mm. a couple of years back. Mm. So I think what we must be careful about is, Hori, when culture changes, and I think as women, we can yeah. change culture, mm. yeah. you know, oh, it, it, yes. we can definitely yeah. change culture, mm. but we must be careful of the agenda mm. in which our culture changes. Yes. Mm. And, and it can quick, go backwards, yeah. quite frankly. Mm. Yeah. Let's yeah. not take advantage mm. of the hard-worn rights. We've yeah. seen countries where um, uh, abortion rights have been reversed yeah. mm. where there's been an oh, attempt yes. to do so. So we can't mm. just sit on our laurels. Yeah. The gag rule. The, the gag, gag rule has <laughs> not been helpful. I would say, did you know, by the way, that Queen Victoria was the first woman to wear white at a wedding? Mm? Wow. Did you know that Queen mm. Victoria was the first woman to wear black at a funeral? Wow. Just because of how she felt. And now you call it your culture. culture. Wow. <laughs> wow. Of 
Did you know that? No, yeah, I didn't know. On that's that's true. True. Yeah. It's on that sale. So I think so, culture, of course, changes. It has to. Yeah. Even mm. the white dress will evolve mm. eventually. Mm. You know, isn't it unbelievable? Like that, that one woman. I mean, I love the fact that she's a woman. <laughs> I resent <laughs> what she's done to the world, but I love the fact that she's a woman. So mm. yeah, culture will change when necessary. Yeah. You know, it has to. I think society is not going to change unless we enter into all the different pockets and facets of it True. in order to cause the disruption that we're talking about. So for me, I feel like we need to change the curriculum in our in our basic education, mm -hmm. in our schools. Mm -hmm. We need to be teaching, in fact, all of our children, not just girl children, but we need to be teaching them about their bodies, mm -hmm. about different um, sexual gender and sexual orientations and, and different identities. Yeah. We need to be teaching them about concepts like um, autonomy mm -hmm. and freedom choice and enthusiasm and saying yes. yes 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 <laughs> yeah, <boy. Yes. laughs> we are taught how to say no to sex mm -hmm. but nobody says my child you have a right to enjoy mm -hmm. sex mm -hmm. your first sexual experience mm -hmm. should be something beautiful mm -hmm. you should want to do it mm -hmm. no he shouldn't do this mm -hmm. he should do that so that we know what to expect mm -hmm. and i fully agree with what you are saying and that is why the work that soul city does is advocating for that change in the curriculum. Mm. I remember how when CSE was introduced, there was so much pushback. And we were trying to just say to young people, to children, understand your body. Mm. Understand why it's important to go through menstruation. Why as a young boy at the age of 12, 13, you'll start having wet dreams, right? Mm. All those beautiful things that they must experience without shame, yes. but how they are put to shame just for experiencing what comes naturally. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Just on the point of of, you know, culture, I think that we also need to speak about feminist culture mm. and feminist practice, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are some toxic things that happen. <laughs> oh, yes, that they we can are. Say you go in there. Culture. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and there yep. are some toxic things that we can speak about that, mm. you know, are feminist practice. And I think that, you know, as we have this conversation, we must also bear in mind, Hore, you know, you can't sit with us. Mm. You know, using language to exclude. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you know, just always to remember, Jorge, as we build a feminist culture, it's about equality. Yeah. You know, that it's about inclusion and it's about holding each other. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And also being a real African, being a true African is about accepting all of your Africanness. Mm. And that means accepting the parts of you that are queer, that are women, that are living with disability, all the parts of you, because mm. You are me, and I am you. Yes. And that's what makes us truly African. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. oh, on that note, <laughs> to accept all things unconsciously, just because that's how it's always been done, is mm. to allow unacceptable practices to dominate our society mm -hmm. and to perpetuate discrimination and abuse yeah. of women and transgender communities. Mm. As we continue to evolve in this fast-moving era of the fourth industrial revolution, it becomes crucial that we not lose our cultures and customs, but consciously transform them to be inclusive and compassionate. Mm -hmm. yeah. As we consciously choose to become a more compassionate society with the goals of achieving peace and prosperity for all, it becomes incumbent on all of us to individually take a look at how we are perpetuating discrimination, enabling patriarchy, and the abuse of vulnerable members of our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our incredible team and guests. Next week, this is what we'll be talking about. I am a child of God. I'm also black and gay. Today we're discussing the big daddy of religion's problems, patriarchy in religion. God says I am his child. We have this understanding, we're like this, we're tight. In rejecting the feminine in themselves, men then act violently in the, uh, against the feminine in other people, starting from queer people and then moving all the way through to women. In lots of our religious institutions, which is still very male and masculine, women are excluded. The church must understand that it's not listening to basic empathy. People's sexual orientations should not exclude them from an institution which should be all-inclusive. The church was supposed to be leading society in terms of inclusivity and love, uh, embracing outcasts, the marginalized people considered sinners. We need to see all people in the image of God. Next week's episode, we delve into the world of religion and patriarchy, asking the question, how does religion affect feminism?
Mm. Until next week, from our team, we say good night and goodbye.